Father, I ask that you not only speak to me, but you will speak through me. Father, that our hearts will be open to your word. Father, that your spirit will go out and, and be with the sharps today. Father, that you would come and you've, you're already here. I already know you're here. I sense your presence. But Father, I just ask that you would just come alongside each and every one of us this morning who are in different places in our lives, in our walk with you, and that you would just help us to get to the place where we need to be. Speak to us this morning in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Chippy the parakeet. Uh, I think we've got, there's Chippy's picture. Uh, never saw it coming. Sitting in his cage all nice and proper and, and, and singing the songs that he sings. And his owner come over and decided it was time to clean Chippy's cage. So she pulls out the vacuum cleaner, opens up the cage, and I, she's probably done it many times before, stuck the end of the, the vacuum cleaner after she turned it on. She stuck it inside the cage and started cleaning. When the process, the phone rang. Well, as she reached for the phone... All of a sudden, all she heard was, Choof! and she turned around and no chippy. So she quickly goes and opens up the, the vacuum cleaner bag, and here's Chippy, stunned, still alive, all covered with dirt and dust and everything, and she thought, oh, no. She grabs Chippy and runs into the sink, shoves Chippy underneath the water, And then realizes after she's already shoved him underneath the water that Chippy, Chippy is, is, is shivering. So she reaches over and grabs the blow dryer. And then puts Chippy back in its cage. Chippy at that point was sucked in, washed up, and blown. And blown up. <laughs> This morning, if you'll turn with me to Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8, 23 through 27. Then he, Jesus, got into the boat, and his disciples followed him. Without warning, a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. He replied, You of little faith, why are you so afraid? When he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm, the men were amazed and asked, What kind of man is this? Even the winds and waves obey him. How many of you at one point in time or, or the other have felt like Chippy? That life has just sucked you in. <laughs> um, that, that life has just sucked you in, washed you up, and blown you apart. And you're sitting there totally stunned. If we follow Chippy another couple days later, the, the one that was doing the interview and, 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 saw, and, and saw the outcome of all this, walks in and Chippy still has not got his song back. Have you ever gotten to the point in your life that the storms of life have hit you so hard, so fast, and so furious that it, is, that is, it has taken the song from your heart? I think all of us at one point in time or the other have been to that point. And here is Chippy several days later sitting there, 
Uh, not knowing what to, not knowing what has happened for one. But it takes a while to recover. Anytime we are hit with things, it takes, sometimes it takes us a while to recover. In, in the story of, of Jesus calming the sea, one of the first things that, that we see is that in, in verse 24, it says, without warning. The, the, the storm comes without warning. Uh, to me, that's, that's, <laughs> that's when the, the cage was open and she turned away and, and that vacuum cleaner grabbed a hold of Chippy. Sometimes in our life, and usually a storm, w- there are some storms we do see coming, but not, normally when a storm hits us in our life, it comes like it did with Chippy. It comes in an instant. And it sucks us in so quick. Uh, an example would be my wife here a few weeks ago. Day started off fine, and, and she calls me at work, and she says, um, can you, well, it was in between the driving the bus and uh, working in the cafeteria. And she says, can you come home? And so I did. Uh, our plans were at the time to, to go out to eat. You know, we'll go, come, I'd come home, and I've got a little bit of time, and we would zip out to a restaurant and get a, a bite of breakfast, and then I would drop her back off and, and head back to work. Uh, but before I got home, she got a phone call. And as soon as she got her phone, I was sitting there when she got the phone call, and the look on her face told me I didn't, well, yeah, I needed to know what was going on, but I knew it wasn't good news. Her grandmother, who had raised her for like three years, had died. And although this, is, this was one of those times that we, she had been in a, a, um, a home for, for, for several years, and she knew that phone call was coming someday, it hit her like a ton of bricks. And so then we had to quickly grab things together and because and head for to Kentucky. Um, the second, the second. Oh, you can't. Maybe you can see this better out there. Uh, things hit us so fast. A storm does. This is a, a picture of Tuscaloosa in April of this year. A before and after picture. And I don't know how many people, uh, or you've probably even seen it here. I know um, how many went through some of the hurricanes that come through here, about everybody. Uh, But how fast it hits and the devastation that it leaves in its path. Well, one day you see the houses that are just, that are sitting there and and uh, nobody knows what's going on. And the very next day it's totally gone. I've, I saw some pictures when we were looking through this, especially looking at Tuscaloosa. You could see one day all these houses that were sitting here, and the next day you'd never know, almost, except for the, the road path, that there was ever even houses there. It, it cleaned it off that quick, and that's how quick it hits. Without warning, uh, in our lives... Uh, <laughs> Have you ever been uh, going to school? This has happened to me a couple times when I was in college. But you get a phone call or it's on the answering machine or, or whatever, and the phone call says, you know the paper that was supposed to be due next week? And usually it's one of your classmates that, that gives you the message. 
Uh, remember that paper that was due next week? Yeah, I remember. Uh, he changed it. It's due tomorrow. Remember, you get a phone call or you get something in the mail and that quick uh, you get message that the IRS is going to audit. Or you get a message, you walk into work one day and, and, and your boss comes to you and says, uh, you know, I like you and I like your work but I don't like your wife or your kids or you doing church work, so go file unemployment. All of a sudden, storms will hit unexpectedly. Sometimes, they, sometimes you can see them in the distance. Sometimes you cannot see them at all when they, when they raise up and, and grab a hold of you. Uh, if, you'll, if you'll think of the time in Matthew uh, later on, I think it's in chapter 14, where the disciples are out at sleep. Matter of fact, it was right after the feeding of the 5,000. Jesus specifically looks to the disciples and he says, now, now catch this, he already knows the storm is brewing and he tells the disciples, get, it in, the boat, get in the boat and go. I'll catch up with you later. He didn't go with them. There's times we are sent out. There's times we are sent out with the and storms hit us so hard sometimes that that we we feel we feel doubt. In our growing up, sometimes it's almost like that God is putting a uh, a window in our heart that we can see that we can see him and draw close to him um, that next one please um, the storms uh, does anybody like storms these kind of storms I, I used to love to go out on the beach and watch them hit the beach but uh, anymore I'm not so so much for storms because uh, I see so much of what they do but um, back to what I was saying, that sometimes it's like God puts an, uh, a window in our heart that we can see him. And as we grow up, some point in time in our life, a pebble will jump up and crack that window and kind of shatter. We thought God was going to take care of everything. And now I can't hardly even see God and I feel like he's leaving me out here to myself. Well, you know, sometimes God does that. I saw on, um, on Facebook this week, uh, Jay Hatfield, who used to be the music minister over at uh, Sumter First, put up, and he was talking about how people always say that God will not give you any more than you can handle. You ever hear that? And he said but that's not exactly the way it's worded. That passage of Scripture says, no temptation that is given us that is such as is common man. And when, when temptation go, comes, God will provide a way to escape. Okay? That's not a promise that he won't let us go through storms. That's not a promise. Matter of fact, he allows us. Matter of fact, he sent the disciples out into a storm they couldn't handle. And I honestly believe he puts us in spots every day in, storm, in the storms of life that we can't handle. So we'll turn and say, help me. Look at Peter in the, in the passage right after when, when God sent them out, when Jesus sent them out and he went into the mountain to pray, he come down on the water, was walking on the water. The disciples looked out and said, it's a ghost. And he said, uh, no, it's not. It's me. And Peter says, if it's you, let me step out of the boat and come to you. And Jesus said, come. And, Jesus, and Peter jumped out of the boat and was, and was doing fine walking on the water until what did he do? 
took his eyes off Jesus. He took his eyes off Jesus and started to doubt. He saw the waves and started to doubt. And when he started to doubt, he started to sink. In our storms of life, the one thing that we need to remember that will keep us afloat is to keep our eyes on Jesus. Is to keep our eyes on, on Jesus. You know, different things hit us. You might get the phone call. Come to the station. Your daughter or son is here. Or a letter on the table that's left for you. And it reads, I've left. Don't try to get a hold of me. It's over. Or a doctor calls with bad news. Any type of thing that, that, that we could, we have no control over. Or we, or we don't see coming that God allows us to go through to, to bring us to him. And I'm not saying he causes different things like this to happen. But you know as well as I do, he, he allows things to take place. And, and to help us to draw closer to him. In the next slide, or the next... Um, The blown over, or the feeling of failure. When we first found this, this, uh, this picture, how many of us have, first of all, how many have played sports, or still do play sports? I, how many of you have made mistakes? Okay. How many have made major mistakes? Okay. We didn't know when we first saw the picture, and, and after I cho we chose it, decided to put it up for, to to demonstrate the failures, the storms of the failures that are in our lives. Then we found out who it belonged to, and I tried to get my wife to uh, superimpose a picture of USC on there or Clemson, <laughs> and then we found find out this is actually. Uh, an Ohio State Buckeye. <laughs> so, and for those of you who don't know, that's where we're from. Um, but that's, but failure and guilt will eat at you. It'll become as much of a storm in your life as anything else. And when we, when we do something wrong, I, I can be the first, I can be the first to confess when I first come to know the Lord. The Lord drew me to himself, and when the Lord drew me to himself, he also sent the Spirit along to, to keep me in check. Because there are times that I would start to go back to some of my old ways, and, and, I, could, and I could feel the presence of God right next to me saying, you don't want to do that. You know I don't want you doing that. Sometimes, most of the time, I would listen and turn away. But there were some times that, and I'll be honest, there were some times that I ignored the Spirit's nudging. And I went ahead and did what was not right. But the end result is God always knew my heart. If you, young people especially, if you don't hear anything else in this message this morning, hear this. Whatever you do, keep in your heart that you want to do what God wants you to do. If you will honor that, and, and in, in your heart of hearts, you want to do what God wants you to do, God will help you make everything else come out. Failures will happen? Yes. Storms will happen? Yes. 
Things will happen that will totally shatter lives. But if your heart is this, God, I still want to be with you. If that will happen in your life, he promises never to leave you. He promises to to help you through the storms. He promises to be with you. Sarah was rich. She had inherited $20 million. Would that make somebody happy in here? $20 million. She had inherited $20 million, plus she had an additional income of $1,000 a day. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money on any day. But this was back in the late 1800s. So that was even more money. Sarah was well known. She was the belle of New Haven. No social event was complete without her presence. No one hosted a party without inviting her. Sarah was powerful. Her name and money would open almost any door in America. Colleges wanted her donations. Politicians clamored for her support. Organizations sought her endorsements. Sarah was rich, well-known, powerful, and miserable. Her only daughter had lived to five weeks of age. Then her husband had passed away. She was left alone with her name, her money, her memories, and her guilt. It was her guilt that caused her to move west. A passion for penance drove her to San Jose, California. Her yesterdays imprisoned her today, and she yearned for freedom. She bought an eight-room farmhouse plus 160 adjoining acres. She hired 16 carpenters and put them to work. For the next 38 years, 16 carpenters working 38 years. And she also uh, hired other craftsmen, laborers, and they worked 24 hours a day to build this mansion. Observers were intrigued by the uh, the project. Sarah's instructions were more than eccentric. They were eerie. She is, I mean, to the point where the fl- floor plan was ghoulish. It just didn't, it was almost like a labyrinth. It just, it went anywhere and nowhere. It would go down to the end of a hallway where, or end of a, where there wasn't any hallway. The, there would be doors where it would open into the wall or doors that it would open and there would be a drop-off. Uh, that's how she built her house. And The making of this mysterious mansion only ended when Sarah died. Why did Sarah want such a ca- castle? Didn't she live a well? Did she lo- she lived alone, except for this sense of guilt. And what happened because of having this sense of guilt? Once a week or so, she would go to a certain part of her house in the evening, and open up the doors and the windows, and in, and in her mind. She was inviting the ghost of the West to come in. And the reason she did this was because of her guilt. And I know, and I can see it on faces. <laughs> Why do you, how is this all turning? How is this all coming together? Well, her name was Sarah Winchester. That might not mean anything to you. 
but the first repeater rifle that was, e- that was ever mass produced was a Winchester. Her family was the ones who had, had built these rifles and had sold them, and that's where they made their money. And she knew that almost every one of its owners at some point in time were du- was killed because of a Winchester. And she took that guilt upon her own self. And she lived with that guilt until the day she died. Has there ever been a time in your life that you had guilt? The storm that hit you so hard because of a failure that you had done? That, that, that you, could, you could not get, you could not, maybe even today, you still have the guilt inside of you. Has a storm hit you to that point where the guilt has come into your life and you can't shake that guilt, regardless of what you've done, regardless of what you've tried to do, that that guilt will not go away? Have you ever heard it said, the hardest person to forgive is yourself? I tell you what, this morning, folks, if God can forgive us, if God can forgive me for the things that I've done, he can forgive anyone. As much as I know, this is a true story. In the 1800s, in around the border of, of Kentucky and West Virginia, there was a famous feud. Do you remember what that famous feud was about? I think I heard it. Hatfield and the McCoys. Anybody know what actually started that feud? What started the feud? No. <laughs> they, they did have Winchesters. Yes, they did. Yes, they did. Uh, it has been proven that some of the rifles they used was Winchesters. But it didn't start the feud. They said at one point in time, it was, they thought it was over hogs, some pigs. And, and it just grew from a little bit of nothing until the, this huge feud took place. Well, ants, also known as ants, uh, Hatfield, also known as the devil, they said that he would shoot somebody just to look at him. I mean, they said any time he was around, people were ducking and dodging and getting out of his way because that's the way he was. So, towards the end of... towards the end of the Hatfield and McCoy feud, in church one Sunday, the back door flew open, and in walk Ants Hatfield. Well, as soon as he walked through the back door, everybody in the church hit the floor because they, sure, they were sure somebody was going to die. The guilt had got to Ants Hatfield. And, and from what I'm under, am able to understand, Ants Hatfield made his way to the front of the church that day and knelt at the altar and gave his heart to the Lord. You know something, folks? We've got an awesome God that changes our hearts, that changes our lives. One of these days, I'm going to show you some pictures. Or if you want, ask me about it. I carry them with me every time I bring my Bible. I've got these pictures with me. When, st- the, storm of, when the storm of life hit me before, before I ever knew the Lord, about two, about two to three months before I accepted the Lord, I got pictures of myself then. And then I've got a, I've got a, a picture of myself about two or three months after I accepted the Lord. 
my wife said she would have never given the one the time of day. And, we, and the other one she's married, been married to for 24 years. Okay? God promises in his word that all things will be made new. Folks, when the storms of life hit you, we have got such a powerful God. Look at Chippy again. If you, let's go back to Chippy, the, the parakeet. Okay? When Chippy was sucked into that vacuum cleaner, when he was sucked in, washed up, and blown, up, blown apart, blown dry, he was traumatized to no belief. And that's the way we are when we come out on the other side of a storm. True story, and then I'm going to close. When we first, and this tells a little bit about me, and, and I wanted to put a little bit about me because you guys don't really know me, okay? Uh, when I came out of the Marine Corps, I went into uh, a college in Cincinnati, uh, Cincinnati Christian College. It's now Cincinnati Christian University. And went into, which is part of the Christian Church, Church of Christ, the instrumental side, the ones that believe in using instruments in the church. And I went in and was ordained in that church and was ordained in that church for 20 years. And it seemed like every church we went into, there was problems. Every church, the, the storms hit like crazy. The last Christian church, Church of Christ, I was in was when the Lord brought us to South Carolina right outside of Shaw Air Force Base. My first weekend there, I took a vacuum, a church vacuum cleaner, and took it into Sears to have it repaired. Just so happens there was another man that was bringing his church vacuum cleaner in to have it repaired. Side note, my wife was born and raised in the Nazarene church. 24 years ago, I preached on Sunday morning in the one church, and we got married in the Nazarene church in the afternoon. Okay, but now, back to South Carolina. We're in Sears getting the, our, our vacuum cleaners fixed, and I, so I got to talking to this man. And he introduced himself. He was, his name was Pastor Scott Lowry. We exchanged numbers. When, we, when I left Autumn Woods Christian Church, we started going to First Church, and Scott was there. Scott handed me a manual, and I, at the time, I was a uh, corrections officer down at Watery, and at the prison, I read, and the first words of the manual when I started reading it, and the first, when I started and got into the beliefs and started reading it, it hit me. Harold, I know why you've been having the storms of life in these churches. You didn't realize it, but you've been preaching holiness to a non-holiness church <laughs> for 20 years. And it was at that time the Lord laid on my heart that I needed to change. Storms of life hit folks for a reason. I just, and you know, if I would have listened, I, I am stubborn in a lot of ways. Is there anybody with me? Is anybody stubborn out there? Uh, in a lot of ways, I'm, thank you. I, I, <laughs> in a lot of ways, yes, I am. But the thing about it is, when God says it, I had a preacher almost as long ago as we've been married told me I needed to be in the Nazarene church. Okay. Storms of life. Chippy. I like Chippy because Chippy represents me. And I'm sure he represents a lot of you all. If you're here this morning and a storm has hit, 
You know, we're called to ask for our brothers and sisters to pray for us. If you're here and you need prayer this morning, feel free to come. Uh, Zach, you have something? Um, But mainly folks, young folks, children, keep in your heart that you want God in your heart. You know, there's one thing that, uh, there's songs that are in, that my anchor holds and, and stuff like that. It is so true that we are so, if we let our hearts be anchored to him, he will bring us through anything. He'll bring us through the vacuum cleaner of life that'll suck us in, wash us up, and blow us apart. Let's stand. for this sermon today, Father. We come before you, Lord, as we begin to close, Lord, that, Father, you know each and every one of our 
pains and our sufferings, Lord, that you just sit here and you will touch us, Father. Lord, that you continue to be with us through each and every one of life's storms, Father, no matter how bad they may be, Father, that you are here with us, Lord. Lord, you know each and every storm that each and every person in this church, Father, right now is going through, Father. Lord, you know each and every pain that any of their family members or people that they are praying for are going through, Father. And Father, I would just ask that you would touch everybody who would came to church today, Father, and all the people that are on their hearts, Lord, and all the people who didn't come to church, Lord, that you would just continue to work on them so that they would come, Father. Father, that you would help us to realize, Lord, that even when the storm seemed like it's impossible, we just can't go on, Father, that you are there. And Lord like the song, the casting crown sings, Lord, that we would just continue to praise you through this storm. And that when it seems like we just can't do anything, we just fall on our knees, Lord, and that you will hear us when we call, Lord, because you know us. And you know our names. And you see each tear that falls. And Lord, I ask that today as we leave, Father, and as we all drive home, when we go, Lord, that we will go and we will continue to live our lives towards you, Father, and we will continue to walk towards you, Father. And I ask that you would keep every person here, Lord, protected, Father. And Father, I just ask that you would just touch each and every person during this week, Father, and really lay something on their heart, Father. Put something on their minds, Lord, and help every each and every one of us become better blessings for you, Father. Lord, I ask this all in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a nice day.